Thank I'd you. like to now uh, introduce our next presenter, Dr. Connie Kellum. She's a professor of global health and medicine and epidemiology in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the University of Washington. Her research focuses on clinical trials of biomedical HIV prevention with the objective to find effective strategies to reduce HIV acquisition and transmission and to conduct implementation science of evidence-based strategies for HIV prevention and treatment with a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. We are pleased to welcome her for her presentation, Chlamydia and Gonorrhea on the Rise, Updated Guidelines for Testing and Treating. Thank you. Dr. Callum, you are muted currently. Okay. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation to present today. And I, although it, my talk will focus on chlamydia and gonorrhea, I uh, decided to do a case-based approach to try to also include a couple of cases around syphilis. Um, see if I can get my screen to advance. So I have served as a scientific advisor to Merck and Gilead. Um, so the objectives of this talk are to um, understand and interpret the recent uh, trends in sexually transmitted infections and with a uh, focus on gonorrhea and chlamydia, but also uh, syphilis. Again, to use some cases to highlight some of the points that Dr. Augenbrown just made about uh, treatment and, uh, first of all, recognition of neurosyphilis and treatment, and then uh, screening and treatment of uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia. So there's the figure worldwide from the WHO is that there are 1 million new curable STI infections per day. And these um, primarily, over 90% of these occur in low and middle income countries where we're still seeing that syndromic STI diagnosis is the mainstay. And that is really um, a big challenge. And WHO is currently trying to address this by updating guidelines and hopefully introducing more diagnostic testing, including uh, point of care testing. The reasons why STIs matter in part are that they have both negative health and social outcomes, and particularly for young women. And so this is, again, particularly an issue in Sub-Saharan Africa where STIs are very prevalent. We're seeing in some of the studies I've done in PrEP, we're seeing one out of uh, two to one out of three women have uh, chlamydia, most of which is asymptomatic and is not being diagnosed with syndromic management. So it's a big issue. We're also seeing high rates of STIs in persons on PrEP. And on the right-hand slide, this comes from a really excellent review published last year by Jason Ong. We're looking globally at STI rates in PrEP users, and you can see about a tenfold higher rate of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis in PrEP users. And some of this is the the right people are getting on PrEP, that they are at higher risk of STIs, and we're also doing more frequent testing, so we're diagnosing more. And I think that this is becoming apparent that now we're into our fifth year, consecutive year of increasing rates of STIs um, in the US, uh, and CDC has been trying to get the word out that this is, the numbers are disturbing, but also, the fact that we're seeing uh, ongoing antimicrobial resistance in gonorrhea, we're seeing syphilis rates that um, are actually higher about than what we saw pre-AIDS and that there's now spread into heterosexual networks with new cases of congenital syphilis in some parts of the US. And we're even seeing um, LGV proctitis. So STIs are not just a nuisance, they're really, um, they seem to be here to stay and we're seeing more morbidity. These are some of the data from um, 2006 or 2000 to 2016 and just showing the slope of the curves where we're seeing rises in syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia across these time 
courses. And if you extend them out to the last several years, the curves uh, are similar. So it's particularly worrisome with syphilis, which as you heard about in the prior talk is causing um, morbidity and uh, we really need to get on top of this if we can. Another reason why we should care is that not only do STDs cause morbidity, such as syphilis, but also gonorrhea and chlamydia, particularly in women of reproductive age, but they also increase the risk of HIV acquisition. And on this slide, you can see in a prospective data from New York City STI clinics that among men who have sex with men who are diagnosed with rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia, what chlamydia, one in 15 were diagnosed with HIV in a year. For those that had primary or secondary syphilis, one in 18 were diagnosed with HIV in a year. And that compares to one out of 53 if they had neither a rectal STD or syphilis. So STDs still matter in terms of risk of HIV acquisition. And it's not just symptomatic STDs. There are data that have come out of Africa suggesting that even in um, so-called asymptomatic STIs, there are pro-inflammatory cytokines that may increase susceptibility to HIV. And so we're really missing the boat with syndromic management, which is not the focus of my talk, but I just want to really make that point again. And it's really imperative that we come up with better approaches to STI diagnosis and management in the parts of the world where HIV incidence remains high, particularly in young women. So why are we seeing these rising STI rates? And part of it is, is that we've had public health success, successes. The, the whole emphasis on encouraging people to become undetectable, to get into uh, HIV treatment and achieve viral suppression is a big bonus. And I think the U equals U movement has been very important in terms of destigmatizing HIV, but it also means that there's less impetus to use condoms. In addition, in 2012, FDA approved PrEP, and that has also provided a new biomedical prevention strategy that has made condom use um, less um, less of a reliance for um, persons who feel that they're at risk of HIV. So these are good things overall, but it means that we're now perhaps paying part of the price in terms of rising STI rates. So my first case I wanted to get your perspective on is this is a, a patient who comes to the clinic for routine HIV follow-up. He's been doing well, virally suppressed for five years. He uh, has a stable partner, as well as um, some more casual partners. He is not using condoms with his primary partner, but uses condoms with his other partners. And he's had four partners in the last three months. He has both insertive and receptive anal sex, has had no symptoms. And his history, STI history, is that he had uh, two episodes of secondary syphilis uh, the last 24 months ago, started out with an RPR of 1 to 128, drop down over serial follow-up to one to four, and now his test comes back at one to 16. So I wanted to get the audience's feedback about what you would do. Would you treat with treat this increasing titer, two-fold titer uh, increase with benzathine penicillin, 2.4 million units IM times one? Would you use benzathine penicillin um, weekly for three weeks? Would you call the patient and ask about um, ocular and otosymptoms, neurosymptoms, and then repeat the test and then um, treat only if it's higher? Would you repeat the RPR or would you refer for lumbar puncture? So let me see what the audience has to say here. Okay. All right. Well, as with many, uh, can we show, share this uh, screen, the results of the poll with the audience now? Great. So um, I would, in this situation, probably repeat the test and uh, ask about symptoms. And one of the reasons for repeating the test, can you see this slide now, is that shown? 
is that the more repeat tests you do, the higher the chance of false positives. And these, this was first reported uh, 30 years ago by Barbara Romanowski, but it's also um, indicated by our analyses of data in Seattle King County that if you um, look at a two tighter increase in RPR, that the positive predictive value is only about 73%. So I think the first thing to do in this situation is to um, repeat the titer and also to ask about ocular and odo symptoms um, in case there is early uh, neurosyphilis. So not, you know, I think you can end up sort of chasing uh, these early um, low titer increases and repeating the test and asking about symptoms is really important. Speaking of symptoms, the second case is a 29-year-old HIV positive man who was seen in Seattle uh, with a CD4 count of 20, 219. He was off ART. He had basically um, fallen out of care. His viral load was 41,000. And he had a three-month history that started with um, uh, some sort of localized flashers and then floaters in his eyes, then paresthesias, um, sore joints. He then had a rash about eight months ago. Remarkably, he had lost 40 pounds and um, really was bed bound. And um, on questioning said, yes, his husband has similar symptoms. He really had profound visual loss. He could only see shapes and light only. He could not count fingers. He was so weak that he couldn't stand. And his um, labs, well, first of all, his exam showed that he had, a, um, they had a slit lamb exam done and he had bilateral anterior uveitis with retinal detachments bilaterally. The CSF showed a white count of 318 that was um, lymphocyte predominant and a positive VDRL and FDA in his CSF. So this was actually picked up in the MMWR. We had five cases that year of ocular syphilis. And as Dr. Algenbrod said, this has been investigated elsewhere. And we actually did typing of the um, syphilis to see if there was anything unusual in terms of its um, pathogenicity and could not find any mutation, mutations or any abnormal changes in the genome. So I, the question for the audience is, what would you do? Would you, you treat with IV ceftriaxone, two grams Q24 hours, procaine penicillin, um, IM uh, once daily, plus probenicid to increase the, um, the half-life? Would you use IV penicillin, 20 million units daily, benzathine penicillin, um, 2.4 million units, IM weekly times three weeks, or doxycycline, 100 milligrams times 28 days? So let's take a poll from the audience. Great. And can you push this out to the audience? Great. Well, I agree with people. I think that in this situation, the best um, option is the third option of IV penicillin, um, 20 million units daily. Um, we have much less experience with IV ceftriaxone for uh, neurosyphilis and in this case ocular syphilis definitely would be very reluctant to use um, procaine penicillin and the last two options are really not um, sufficient you just don't get high enough CSF levels so this is a case where either by hospitalizing the patient or using a IV penicillin pump um, they should get high dose um, penicillin and um, I think the key thing, and you heard a lot about the natural history of uh, neurosyphilis from Dr. Augenbrown, is that really we're talking about early neurosyphilis, where sometimes the symptoms can be subtle. This case that I presented was a fairly extreme case where someone allowed these symptoms to progress, um, was really um, very disengaged from care, but we can make the diagnosis earlier and we should be asking questions to try to diagnose it. All of us were taught about late uh, neurosyphilis, but really we rarely see this anymore and we're much more likely to see early neurosyphilis and need to know how to diagnose it. So first of all, need to know that it's 
about three and a half percent of all syphilis cases are complicated. And um, we define that as neurosyphilis, otosyphilis, ocular syphilis. And the key questions to ask are have persons had any change in their vision, floaters, even you know, flashing lights, photophobia, changes in hearing, newer change tinnitus, and difficulty in walking. And this would be one situation if the answer to any of those are yes, would be to do a lumbar puncture. Be aware that a lumbar puncture can be normal and ocular syphilis and otosyphilis because you may have very isolated um, cranial nerve involvement. If there are vision symptoms or hearing symptoms, it's important to get um, specialty evaluation from an ophthalmologist or ENT physician. Um, and treatment should be instituted while waiting for um, the, and not waiting for the results of the remaining labs. And um, just to be aware that if someone does um, have a normal LP and a normal opto exam, that rules out ocular syphilis. Otosyphilis is really a clinical diagnosis, so the audiometry findings are important, and you can't really rule it out. Now let's shift and talk about gonorrhea and chlamydia. You know, I think the new uh, themes with gonorrhea are that we're continuing to see more of it. We're also continuing to see antibiotic resistance, which presents treatment issues. We have excellent ways of diagnosing it with urine and rectal and pharyngeal nucleic acid amplification tests. They work really well, high sensitivity, better sensitivity actually than culture, particularly for the pharynx and the rectum, but you don't get resistance results. That may change over time. There are labs that are working on developing probes for resistance, but if you are suspicious for resistance, um, you should do a culture as well. It's recommended to do annual screening of the sites that are exposed, urethra or cervix, pharynx and rectum, and do it more frequently, like in our uh, clinics where we're doing it um, every three months if people are having more uh, exposure. And to consider retesting if there's any question about um, treatment or treatment efficacy. The slide on the right just shows the slope of the curves over the last couple of years and just shows that it's been fairly stable in heterosexual men and women, but the increase has been primarily in MSM and a growing proportion of the diagnoses are coming from outside STD clinics. So private providers really do need to know how to diagnose and manage gonorrhea. The other important theme for gonorrhea and chlamydia is that we're seeing more extragenital uh, infections. It's about 10% um, of people who MSM who are screened in the National Health um, Biobehavioral Survey in 2017 had um, rectal chlamydia if they were HIV positive. It was closer to 7% if they were HIV negative and slightly lower no numbers for rectal GC and um, and even lower numbers for pharyngeal chlamydia and intermediate numbers for pharyngeal GC. So why do we care about extragenital infections? One is that we know it's harder to treat gonorrhea when it's in the pharynx um, due to lower antibiotic levels, plus um, there are commensal neisseria. So this might be where resistance um, is transferred. And also for rectal infections, it does increase the risk of HIV acquisition, as we talked about earlier. The other important theme with um, gonorrhea is that we're seeing growing numbers of countries that have um, what we consider high-level ceftriaxone and azithromycin. Here showing seven countries that have high-level ceftriaxone resistance, mainly in Eastern Europe and uh, Latin America, and then high levels of um, Zithro uh, resistance in um, even more uh, countries. So the treatment issues are going to be addressed in the upcoming CDC guidelines. There are other countries that are using higher doses of ceftriaxone. We currently recommend 250, but it may be that we'll see a shift to 500 milligrams so that you overcome some of that low level resistance and also get higher levels in the pharynx. Unfortunately, we have limited options in cephalosporin 
allergic patients. Um, we don't have spect spectinomycin anymore. And so the CDC recommends desensitization. You can treat gonorrhea with azithromycin, but it requires two grams and almost half of people will have GI tolerance issues. Plus we're seeing in some countries um, and in some localities like Seattle that we're seeing growing resistance to azithro. And so uh, with some treatment failures. If fluoroquinolones are the only option, obtain a culture if possible to try to document sensitivity. And if that's not possible, get a test of cure. There are drugs that are in the pipeline. The one that looks most promising is zolofidosin, which has um, been in a phase two trial and now and shows high efficacy and is moving into a phase three trial. So stay tuned. Hopefully, this is similar to it's a topo iso isomerase inhibitor, so it has a different mechanism of action, and we really do need new GC drugs. So the third case is a 45-year-old HIV-positive um, man who has six, sex with men, who has congenital, uh, had congenital cataracts, and he presented to the ER with discharge pain and decreased acuity in his left eye. And as you can see, he had a really purulent um, conjunctivitis. Curiously and consistently, he denied any sexual activity other than deep kissing. His um, culture came back from the uh, conjunctival exudate, positive for go Neisseria gonorrhea. So he was actually admitted because the ophthalmologists were really concerned about him. All his other cultures, blood, pharyngeal, urine, and rectal cultures were negative. However, he had received some treatment before that. So what would you treat this patient who has um, uh, gonococcal conjunctivitis? Would like to hear if the audience would treat with ceftriaxone 125 IM, 250 IM, azithro 2 grams PO, or ceftriaxone 1 gram IV. So can we poll the audience? Okay. All right, why don't we show the results? Great. So what he was treated with Ceftrax and one gram IV. And I think this is a situation where you wanna get really high levels. He already had, um, you know, we weren't sure if it was a big issue about having the congenital cataracts, but he had, um, really profound um, decreased eyesight uh, and um, perhaps um, there was some concern too whether we just, he had had perhaps hematogenous spread. It was just a very weird story. We could never get um, a clear uh, ascertainment of how he acquired it. Presumably if his story was accurate, it was uh, auto inoculation after acquiring um, uh, GC through deep kissing, but it was not ever really clear. But the management decision was to give him IV ceftriaxin and err on the side of giving um, a higher dose of sy systemic ceftriaxin. Then the last case is an asymptomatic HIV positive patient that we saw in clinic who tested positive, positive for rectal chlamydia. His other uh, pharyngeal urine tests were negative. He's RPR negative. How would you treat him? Would you treat him with doxycycline, 100 milligrams POBID for seven days, azithro one gram once, azithro two grams once, or as ceftrax and 250 IM plus azithro one gram once? Let's see what the audience thinks. Okay, why don't we share the results? Okay, let's push out the results. And I 
chose to present this one because I would say in this situation, doxycycline is the best choice. So number one, and the reason for this uh, is that, uh, and this will probably be addressed in the new uh, CDC STD treatment guidelines that are coming out uh, hopefully very soon, that although the guidelines say either azithromycin one gram um, PO or seven days of doxycycline, and we know that clinicians prefer the um, single dose regimen, the retrospective studies consistently have shown that doxy is more effective than azithro for rectal chlamydia. And that's shown on the right with about a 20% higher, um, almost 20% higher efficacy. There is a recently completed phase four double-blind placebo-controlled RCT of doxy versus azithro for treatment of rectal chlamydia and MSM, and that should be presented next month at the National STD Prevention Conference. So that may also influence guidelines. But I think some as local STD jurisdictions, including ours, have already gone to uh, preferring doxycycline for azithro for higher cure rates. Lastly, I'll just finish up and just say we should be doing multi-site screening in both MSM and transgender women. Um, if they have any rectal or pharyngeal exposure in the past year, we should screen at least annually or more frequently up to every three months. If they had a bacterial STD in the past year, if they're using meth or poppers, have multiple partners defined at least in our um, clinic greater than 10 partners condomless anal sex with a partner who's known to be positive or on PrEP. So these are some of the criteria we're using and finding that this is highly acceptable. It um, works well. We get as high a uh, sensitivity as if it was provider obtained. And we have these kind of posters in the bathrooms and um, it's become very well integrated into our STD and HIV clinics. So I'll just finish and say, um, for patients with syphilis, we should be asking about photophobia, vision loss, gait and coordination, and hearing loss to try to identify that sm small subset, but really important subset who have complicated syphilis. We should be aware that the treatment guidelines are coming out soon, and there's a possibility that they'll actually drop azithromycin because we think that that is contributing to the rising MICs of GC uh, for azithro, as well as might be contributing to more resistance to azithromycin in mycoplasma genitalium. There's also um, potentially going to be an increase in the dose of ceftraxin recommended for standard treatment. For rectal chlamydia, we should be um, anticipating that the CDC will move to doxycycline instead of azithro, and that's true also for NGU, which um, is either typically caused by chlamydia or mycoplasma genitalium, where we're finding higher resistance to macrolides with, uh, such as azithromycin. And then for higher risk MSM and transgender women, we should be doing quarterly HIV STI testing, offering PrEP if they're negative, certainly linking to care if they're positive, and make self-testing easy. Um, and I think your patients will like it. So there's a lot of, um, emphasis on testing and treating, but what's the future? And I'm just going to end by talking about um, something that Dr. Algebron uh, was asked a question about doxycycline um, post-exposure or pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the data, um, I'm not showing the slide, there was one small uh, study done in HIV positive MSM in, in Los Angeles with 30 MSM suggested that there could be efficacy of pre-exposure prophylaxis, but the bigger amount of data come from the Ypres-Gay uh, event-driven 211 PrEP study in France, where they did a open label study of doxypep versus no pep in about 240 MSM. They recommended men dose it within a uh, single dose within 72 hours after sex, and they saw a 70% reduction in chlamydia and syphilis, so a 50% reduction overall in STIs. However, they saw no reduction in gonorrhea. Part of that is because tetracycline resistance is so prevalent in gonococcal isolates in France. 
this was a, this 50% reduction overall in, uh, in STIs with a 70% reduction in chlamydia and syphilis was seen with men taking an average of seven pills per month, and they saw no evidence of risk compensation. So there's a lot of interest in this, but we don't know whether it'll work in persons living with HIV. We just have that small body of evidence from the Los Angeles study with 30 MSM living with HIV. There may be differences in adherence, efficacy, and effect on antimicrobial resistance. In the US where daily prep is still the majority of ways, um, the most common way it's being prescribed. How well will men um, taking daily prep be able to use daily prep and then a event-driven dri doxy? Will it work in younger, more heterogeneous populations? In the French study, they were highly educated in their late 30s, maybe better able to plan and, um, and dose around sex. And will we have some efficacy in the US where tetracycline resistance in GC is lower? But really importantly is will intermittent doxycycline, if it shows efficacy against STIs, what's the downside? Will it increase, increase antimicrobial resistance in um, GC, chlamydia, or syphilis? We really don't anticipate it in chlamydia. Um, it's not first line uh, treatment for gonorrhea, but we really need to know uh, whether there's a downside with STIs, whether it increases tetracycline resistance in commensal Neisseria species that live in the throat, whether we see resistance in Staph aureus and in the gut microbiome. So that is being asked in a study that was launched at the end of last year in San Francisco and Seattle, where we're studying doxypep versus no pep in both persons, MSM and transgender women living with HIV or on PrEP if they've had a bacterial STI in the last year. And we'll be looking at efficacy, safety, tolerability, and impact on resistance. So if you're in San Francisco or Seattle, please refer patients. Meanwhile, the other area of potential prevention is potentially meningococcal vaccination. And this um, possibility came out of a case control analysis that was done in New Zealand when they uh, were responding to a meningococcal outbreak and they did um, uh, use a quadrivalent meningococcal, meningococcal vaccine and they found that there's a 30% reduction of gonorrhea in those who are vaccinated. So there is a prospective trial planned with Bexero that has um, the same outer membrane proteins as in the uh, vaccine that was used in New Zealand, but also has additional um, antigens that may increase the homology and effectiveness against gonorrhea. So stay tuned. Thank you, Dr. Kellum. We have just five minutes for some um, audience okay. question if you... Sure. If and I just want to let people know that guidelines will be coming out. So please stay tuned and look to your STD clinical consultation networks and national STD curriculum. So I'm open for questions and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kellum, for that excellent presentation. A uh, few questions. Why is it not recommended to screen for oral chlamydia? Well, until recently, there wasn't, um, the NAT tests were not, um, had not gone through validation for that. Um, the it's not clear, so that's part of it. Part of it is also that we really are not seeing, it doesn't have the same importance um, as oral, oral pharyngeal gonorrhea in terms of the transmission to and the um, association with causing urogenital infection. And um, also the issues with resistance are not there for, um, for chlamydia as they are for gonorrhea. So, you know, I think that there, we do know there have been some studies that suggest you can get transient um, infections of the pharynx, but it really does not seem to have the same clinical or epidemiologic significance as gonorrhea. Great, some questions around the use of azithromycin with ceftriaxone. Um, so one question, if you have a patient with rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia, do you skip the azithro and just give ceftriaxone with doxy? That's what we would do, yes, because I think that the data are 
are from retrospective analyses suggests that doxy is better. You don't need to use both azithro and doxy, so it'd be better to use the doxycycline. And you're saying that the doxycycline would be adequate as a second drug for the, the treatment of uh, chlamydia? I mean, I'm sorry, gonorrhea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that as long, again, this is a situation where you may want to do repeat testing to just make sure it cleared. Um, but it's not clear that we've really, that we get that much from the azithro for secondary, you know, co-treatment. And I think that is one of the possible changes that will come out in the STD guidelines as well. Great. There are a few questions about test of cure. Um, how often do you do it and uh, after what duration? Yeah, so when you're using NAT tests, particularly for chlamydia, you can get positive, uh, you can still detect some um, DNA out to 28 days. So should be waiting um, a month to do test of cure. And, you know, I think that if you're, if you, it's not completely clear that you need to do test of cure testing. So I think if you're on a frequent, um, if you're doing every three months, testing of STIs, you could wait for the uh, next three month interval to do the, the testing. And then you won't get the false positives either. Great, terrific. Several questions, and I think this will be the last question. Several questions from the audience around um, the data that you presented that doxycycline is preferred uh, to azithromycin for rectal chlamydia. However, there's multiple people concerned in their true clinical setting about people returning, um, I'm sorry, people actually getting the, and taking the full week of doxycycline as opposed to azithromycin, which is directly observed therapy, specifically hiding, highlighting certain populations like youth. So thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I know you do have to weigh that. Um, I think if you, this might be a situation where doing a, a test to cure would be appropriate if you really feel like you're not going to get a week, that person to take a week's therapy, then to consider doing a, a te um, test of cure, but again, out a month later. I think that it, this is one of the situations where taking the time to talk to a person and say that really the there's a trade-off and for your own um, safe sort of peace of mind, it would be better to have confidence that you really were treated effectively would be to emphasize the data on um, better outcomes, better efficacy with doxy and try to um, make that your preferred treatment. And then if that's, if you really, if someone says there's just no way they're gonna do it or you had adherence issues with that person before, then azithro could be your backup, but then I would do a test to cure. Thank you so much, Dr. Kellen. We really appreciate your uh, your guidance, and um, we also know that you'll you'll be leading one of the breakout sessions next. So, for people with additional questions, please uh, save them and give them to Dr. Kellum at that time. So, just to wrap up, I want to welcome back to Dr. Michael Sag. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> welcome. So. Uh, We've got one more session for the day, but I wanted to um, do some wrap up slides to remind you what happens because we're not gonna meet together again after the break today. So um, clinical conference day three. So after your participation in the breakout sessions, please complete the evaluation. Again, these are very helpful to us. Um, you do not have to do it all at one setting. If, um, however, um, you could lose it if you're not using the same device. So either sit down with one device or, um, uh, excellent. So break on session reminders. So these are highly interactive. So please participate. We really want you to ask questions, make comments, turn your video on so the group can see each other. You can use the chat function or the microphone to ask questions. Um, so that can be really helpful. Don't worry about sharing your voice. We'd love to hear it. Um, and really expect the speakers to call on you because we want you to contribute to the discussion just like we're if we were in a real room together. So for these meet the breakout sessions, look at your schedule and you can see the Zoom link there to participate and click on that to get zoomed in basically to your breakout session that you signed up for ahead of time. So a reminder right after the breakout session is the um, opening session for the 2020 National HIV Ryan White uh, HIV Care and Treatment Conference. 
This will be available to you on your a Ryan White Clinical Conference sign-in sheet. So if you keep the, the window open, you'll see the live stream start. It's going to start 15 minutes after our breakout sessions end. So that's 1.30 Eastern time. So just stay on and you can participate in that uh, exciting um, discussion about uh, ending the HIV epidemic. A reminder for those of you who have separately signed up for the conference on HIV care and treatment, please use that login information to participate in, in the session. So what will be expected during that uh, opening plenary session, we'll hear from Drs. Cheever, Engles, Azar, and Fauci. So tomorrow, we look forward to seeing you ag again. Tomorrow will be our last day of, for the clinical conference, and you'll note that we're starting a bit later uh, during the day. Uh, so we welcome you then, and thank you, everyone. Uh, please proceed to your breakout sessions.